Despite what you might think, the origin of lamb confit seems to be Scandinavia and not France. Lamb confit tastes quite different from roasted lamb. It is much milder and people who think they don't like lamb usually do like the confit version. Sauce Bordelais is a classic French sauce, although the manner in which I'm preparing it here is unique and I dare say that this Bordelais is better than a Escoffier's. This has a richer flavor and even though it does take a few hours to make, Escoffier's version takes days to make. This is almost a reverse version of Escoffier's recipe in the sequence of steps taken, in fact, as you'll notice if you're familiar with the classic. I have 30 grams of garlic cloves that I have. and now I'm going to mix this with the two tablespoons of salt, coarse salt, and one tablespoon of dried rosemary. Now, if you don't have a mortar and pestle that's big enough, just use a regular bowl. Use a regular bowl. Take the pestle from whatever size you've got and just kind of bash it up a little bit. In this case, it doesn't have to be exact because we're not looking for a fine paste here. We just, we just want to combine it. Okay, and after a couple of minutes, I've got this, this combined well enough to, um, to make use of it. Now, I've got the, the lamb here. I've got about two pounds of lamb. i got to coat this fairly evenly, and then I put it in a container, a container for the refrigerator, and leave it there overnight. And here's what it looks like when it's going into the refrigerator. Now, I said overnight, but in reality, if you leave this for about four hours, it's fine. Okay, it's been in the refrigerator for several hours now. Um, I'm going to knock off the few pieces of garlic here and salt. I'm not going to completely get rid of all of it because some of it will actually be good. But you know, we got too much, right? This is too much garlic and salt and, and all. Now also, <laughs> I don't have a Dutch oven that's quite really ideal size for this. So I'm using regular pot. I'm going to cover it up tightly with foil. And the next step, though, is to put some duck fat on it. Um, I did an experiment on this um, where I used only plain oil. It wasn't so good. If you use only plain oil, it will not become as tender. There's something about the duck fat that, that has some magical properties, it seems. A very fine oil. So we definitely want to want to rub some duck fat into it first uh, for maximum tenderness. And then we'll uh, fill it fill it up the rest of the way with regular. Okay, I got enough oil in here that, that it is definitely submerged. Now I'm going to cover this up tightly with foil because of the long, long braising time and the fact that this isn't a Dutch oven. If it was a Dutch oven, I know that the lid would seal well enough anyway, but uh, it's not. So I'm going to put this on and uh, let it go over. Okay, this um, is after nine hours of being in the oven, and then I actually let it cool down uh, for about an hour uh, just on top of the stove with no extra heat. And I have to be careful in handling the lamb at this point because it's pretty tender, let me tell you. And if you just handle it roughly, the whole thing will fall apart on you, and then you'll have some ugly shredded lamb. In fact, what we're going to do, I'm going to take this out, put it on a platter, so you drain the oil up, put it on a platter. And we're going to refrigerate this so that it, uh, it'll it'll help firm it up again because we, we, it's actually is so tender now that if I were to try to cook it in a sauce or something, it, it's just gonna it's just gonna go into um, like shredded meat. Pour the fat that the lamb was cooked in. This is after it's cooled by the way. I'm going to have to leave it to settle here for a few minutes. We're going to use both of these parts, but for different purposes. Begin cooking with flour and that oil. 
Okay, because there's water in this fat, it's going to bubble up on you. So after uh, it started bubbling up <coughs> on the heat of five, I reduced the heat to two, and I'm going to uh, keep stirring this for a little bit until we get rid of some of that bubbling, maybe two and a half. Now that the foaming subsided, I turned the heat up to three on one to ten. I'm still cooking this slowly because I want to make sure that we have very evenly cooked roux. As the roux is cooking away, we prepare everything else. We have this concentrated, what's essentially lamb stock that uh, came out of the bottom of the fat separator. Um, we have the tomato sauce we're going to use. We have mushrooms, carrots, celery, and onions in the right proportions that have been cut up. I'm going to add about four cloves of garlic to this. Remember, very large pieces. This is part of the strategy. Um, everything's ready. We're now we're just waiting for the roux to come to the brown stage. Okay, <clears throat> it's been uh, quite a few minutes. This roux is very, very close to officially the brown stage. But one of the tricks in, in trying to figure out is it brown, is it, what is it, is you have to have experience, of course, and look at this. This is, <laughs> of course, with this video camera, you can't tell. When you look at it, is this toast? No, it's darker than toast. Is it peanut? No, it's lighter than peanut. How do you know exactly what toast and peanut is? Well, of course, <laughs> you do it enough times, <laughs> you get familiar with it. This is the brown stage, even though you probably look yellow in this terrible video camera. Okay, now I'm going to add the tomato sauce, and you have to do this a little bit at a time. Don't just dump it in, because this, um, <laughs> this roux right now is like napalm. It's, it's extremely, extremely hot. And if you just dump this in, the whole thing will explode in your face. So you have to add the tomato sauce gradually. And again, when I say tomato sauce, I don't mean ragu brand bottled tomato sauce. I mean pureed Italian tomatoes, what Italians call passata. In restaurants, we call this tomato sauce. Okay. This is going to thicken up real fast. As soon as we get enough of that moisture out of there. Now I'm going to add all these vegetables that were cut so coarsely. <coughs> and here's where the fun begins. <laughs> this is going to take a while for all of this to reduce down because, uh, well, it's not really reducing. What we're doing is we're getting the vegetables to exude their moisture. Okay, this is what it looks like after about uh, five and a half minutes. As you can see, still quite gloopy. Every time I do this, I, I can't help but think back. One of my earliest restaurant jobs, <coughs> it was like second or third uh, real job that I had, <coughs> not counting childhood jobs, at this uh, French restaurant in San Francisco. And uh, the saucier didn't have very much respect for me, but uh, he'd been assigned to, to teach me some things. I was basically doing line cooking and um, he was making this kind of sauce and, and he said wouldn't the size of the vegetables that you cut up for the sauce should be in relation to how long it's going to cook and um, so he's making this kind of sauce and he's got the vegetables cut up small and I said you said the size of the vegetables should be in relation to the cooking time and uh, it's going to cook for an hour and a half. So why the vegetables? Why do you, why you cut them up so small? And uh, <laughs> I still remember this. It's kind of like a light bulb went on in his head. And he patted me on the head and he said, You're a genius! <laughs> I didn't even understand what it was that I'd said at the time. And he, he went ahead and, and started changing it, making it this way. The flavor is so much better than the traditional classic way. It's, it's just amazing that nobody thought of this before because it follows all the rules of classic French cuisine. But yet, this is not how it's usually done. You don't have these giant wads of vegetables in there, but you should. This is this is exactly the rule. You got big vegetables, they cook a long time, they'll release their their flavor slowly. If you have little tiny pieces of vegetables, they're gonna release all their flavor all at once. By the time the thing is done cooking, there's not gonna be anything left in it. So 
This is this is going to be much much better result. You'll see. It's it's loose enough now. Now I'm going to add about half the length. until you can no longer smell the alcohol that's going to be because you know, this uh, paste will really absorb flavors including alcohol you're going to have to stir it for three or four more minutes and you can see though it's, it's loosening up it's becoming closer to being a sauce and less like being um, solid Now I'm going to add water, a liter. Now that everything is in, I've increased the heat to a 5 and I'm going to bring this up to a good simmer and then lower the heat to a slow simmer and, uh, and let it cook for a while. Okay, now this is what I'm talking about. Yeah, it's coming at a good simmer. We're going to skim this. If we get some mushrooms along with it, that's okay. They've given up their flavor. They don't really need to be in there. What we want to do is we want to get rid of this scum off of the surface because this will make it a little bit bitter and a little bit floury. I'm not going to worry about trying to get mushrooms out of it. Like I said, if we pick some up, that's okay. They're done anyway. We're going to be straining them out pretty soon. The most important thing is to get rid of the scum. Okay, and you don't have to be anal about that either. Just, just get the bulk of it. Now we're going to turn the heat down. Uh, it was on a five, and by the way, it took <laughs> took about 20 minutes to get up to this point. Now I'm going to turn it down to a three. Keep it going on a slow simmer. One of the reasons why home cooks often <laughs> and restaurant cooks don't get good intense flavored sauces is because they want to boil them up really fast. What happens when you introduce enough heat at the bottom of the pot in uh, what, what you're doing is you're causing so much steam to escape that it actually pulls the volatile oils which is where all the flavor is out along with it. In organic chemistry it's called a steam distillation. It's actually a, a process used on purpose to get um, certain extractable, inextractable materials out with steam. So you don't want to do that. We have a gentle amount of steam coming off and uh, once we've got the scum off, which was the purpose of the rapid simmer, now we can just reduce the simmer down and keep it going very slowly, let all those flavors meld. Okay, it's been simmering away for about an hour. Now we can start removing these solids. You could pass it through a, a sieve, but it will be a difficult process because this is pretty thick and you'll lose a lot of material. Um, it's, it's actually easier just to do this and then put this in a sieve to get some of the liquid back into it rather than, than the other way around. But, you know, whatever you want to do. If you want to do it the other way, do it the other way. Um, also, you need to get the, of course, you need to get the bouquet garni off of this thing, too. So, that's the first step, is, is get the solids out with it. And them. after a minute, you go through it. You can't find anything else. You got everything, you're sure. Then put the sieve on it. Take the solids that you got off back into the sieve and go the other way. whatever you get out that's great but you don't have to worry about it too much because there's only a little bit of the actual liquid that's going to be left on here and push it down there and try to get as much as you can through it As it's reducing, it's going to build up some more scum, and you can take off some of this. Don't be too careful. This will, will make it taste smoother, but it will also reduce the thickening power. So you have to decide how much scum you're going to remove. Okay, <clears throat> this has been on a slow simmer now, 
for another 45 minutes. Um, I pulled skim off of it, uh, scum off of it rather, two times. That's all I'm going to do. I'm not going to um, skim it any more than that, because otherwise I'm going to reduce the thickening power too much. Now I'm going to add what I called the other half of the wine. This being uh, sherry, a medium sherry, not too dry, but uh, also not like Oloroso. You want something medium, <clears throat> and it's going to continue to cook uh, even longer. Now. The meat's been in the refrigerator for several hours. It's about time we, we turn our attention to this lamb. It's got um, the fat cap on it still that's going to have to come off. Um, you're going to have to uh, watch all over it for where there's uh, sinew. You, you, all these heavy parts of fat, these need to go because this is not going not gonna to taste good in the final product. And um, it's going to take some work. I'm not going to make you watch me do the whole thing. You get the idea. Obviously, you want to remove the bones. Um, don't screw up the meat by, by start shredding it. Respect the integrity of the meat because it's very soft right now. And it would be very easy to turn this into like a shredded pork kind of product. That's not what we want. After you've got the, the pieces trimmed down, they start to fall apart in the natural ways that the muscles are organized this piece is all fat and finally uh, one kilogram of lamb I ended up with 420 grams of nice sized pieces that are that are perfectly cooked and, and trimmed in well this sauce is getting thick and it's now been cooking nearly an hour since this uh, uh, vegetables were pulled out of it I'm going to uh, actually take it up to just slightly more than this and then I'm going to leave it and we're going to combine the dish at the end when we're actually ready to serve. What I'm doing here is a kind of, it's a version of fondant potatoes. It's going to be a little bit more rustic looking. So I cut the potatoes kind of irregular. But when you do this, um, you want to make sure you absolutely have a good flat side on one of them. It's been a few more minutes. I turned the potatoes around a couple times. As you can see, they've got pretty good browning on them. It's only been about uh, about eight minutes now since I first put them in the pan. Now we've got a dish here that's uh, got some butter in it already. Toss the potatoes in the baking dish here with the butter. The heat's going to melt that uh, butter in just a minute. I'm also going to add some coarse salt. Right. And some chicken stock here. If the butter didn't melt before, it will now. I heated the chicken stock up in the microwave. And let's make sure I get a single layer, and then this is going to go in the oven. Okay. Just one more thing, though. I put in um, about three cloves of garlic in here. And notice that the chicken stock only comes up about three quarters of the way on the potatoes. We want the, the top surface of the potatoes exposed. This is on purpose. Okay, and after 40 minutes these come out fork tender and uh, we're just going to reserve these to the side until we're ready to serve up the lamb. And when it comes time to serve it, you're going to simmer the meat, the portion of meat that you want, in the portion of sauce that goes with it until the sauce is thick and the meat is completely warmed up and finished.
Also look for my cocktail book, Cocktails of the South Pacific and Beyond, Advanced Mixology, available through Amazon online.